Funding for Frontline is provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. We think that if we can get the message of uh, Islam across and the whole world knows what uh, Islam talks about, then uh, of course it will uh, uh, bring about some changes in the world as a whole. Tonight on Frontline, the threat of fundamentalist terror. Iran is clearly training, recruiting in some cases, and perhaps financing uh, people who support the Islamic movement and are prepared to carry out acts of violence. Religious and political violence is escalating all over the Middle East. How soon will it be felt in the rest of the world? The U.S. is vulnerable as never before. Tonight on Frontline. Holy War, Holy Terror. From the network of public television stations, a presentation of KCTS Seattle. WNET New York, WPBT Miami, WTVS Detroit, and WGBH Boston. This is Frontline with Judy Woodruff. Good evening. Terrorism. We are transfixed by it, terrorized by it. The sophisticated machinery of our Western civilization seems unable to protect itself against a war without rules, a random, unpredictable assault on our values and our lives. We seek out culprits, a country, a leader, a radical faction, a young man with a bag of plastic explosives. We want to cut out the cancer, rid ourselves of this evil. But to do so is to know where to look and then perhaps to find, not a headquarters or a command post, but the most secret place of all, inside a mind. And that is our challenge, to know what's going on in the minds of men and women who believe deeply that it is our world that is evil, our way of life that is unacceptable. Before we can know how, if ever, we can deal with these people, we have to know more about them, and why some that small, extreme minority, have turned to terrorism. Tonight, Frontline reports on Iran's revolutionary Shiites. It's a story about the war they are fighting in the Gulf, a story about their involvement with terrorism, and about their religious creed that goes back 13 centuries. Our program is called Holy War, Holy Terror. It is produced by Stephanie Tepper, and reported for Frontline by John Lawrence. In an Iranian cemetery, a little boy cries. He says he's lost his whole family in the war between Iran and Iraq. His grief is broadcast on Iranian national television in order to whip up war fever. The song sings of Allah. Iranians today believe they're fighting a holy war. They believe that if they are victorious, their ideals will sweep the world. The message of a resurgent Islamic fundamentalism must be considered one of the two greatest ideological innovations of the 20th century. The first, it seems to me, being the message from the Soviet Union, from the Bolshevik Revolution, and the second from Iran and from Khomeini in particular. Well, Ayatollah Khomeini is, is the Messiah. He's the man who will appear and bring about perfect justice in this world. So for his followers, Ayatollah Khomeini is an instrument of wrath, destroying all their enemies, leveling all class pretensions, destroying the modern sector, 
So partly in many ways, Khomeini is like a hurricane. One of Khomeini's major contributions to world history has been the fashioning of this ideology which has served to mobilize Shiites in particular, but Muslims all over the world. When Khomeini dies, that will not change. Islamic fundamentalism has been brought onto the world stage and their political demands are only yet being heard in countries which are going to experience Islamic fundamentalist movements. Through events like these, the Shiites have demonstrated their determination to reassert their way of life and to spread their beliefs through the rest of the world. Events like these have also made the Shiites the object of hatred among Westerners, particularly Americans, and blinded us from understanding what's happening in Iran. Seven years ago, the resurgence of Shia Islam swept the clergy into power in Iran. Today, that same religious passion continues to motivate Iran's war with Iraq and to threaten the stability of the region. Who are the Shiites? Are they fanatics or a different kind of hero? Are they terrorists or the warriors of a righteous cause? Are they worshippers of death or simply devoted followers of another tradition? <laughs> Islam is divided into two main sects. 90% are Sunnis, 10% are Shiites. Founded 1300 years ago as a party of protest, Shiism has been the faith of the poor, the downtrodden, the dispossessed. Soon after the death of Muhammad, some Muslims feared their faith would be usurped by the rich and the corrupt. So they petitioned Muhammad's grandson, Hussein, to lead them. He formed a caravan and with his followers advanced to the city of Karbala, where his enemies awaited him. The odds against him were enormous. And in a dream he foresaw his defeat and told his followers to leave him. All but 72 went. The battle that followed has been adopted as the foundation of Shiism. 72 men standing for God and righteousness against an army 10,000 strong. To Shiites everywhere, Hussein became the martyr Hussein. This willingness to die for a noble cause lives on. Fouad Ajami, one of America's leading Middle East scholars, describes it as a cult of martyrdom. There is something in the psychology of the Shia and the history of the Shia which endows martyrdom with great legitimacy. The story of Hussein's martyrdom at Karbala is reenacted every year all over Iran. But the metaphor of Karbala is one of complete solitude and doom and death. This is the sad part of this whole Shia political psychology. That if you tell people about Karbala, if you pound the theme of Karbala into their heads, if life is always a Karbala, then just imagine the odds against you. You're always riding to a sure death and defeat, and life is a perpetual struggle. Now here comes Khomeini and others around him. And they actually, what they end up saying is that Karbala is every day. Every place is Karbala. And that this Karbala metaphor, this Karbala idea lives on forever. That wherever, wherever Muslims, meaning really Shia, wherever they make a stand, they can construe the world as yet another Karbala.
The main center of Shia study in Iran is Qum. Like the other theologians here, Khomeini's teachings are based on a detailed study of Islamic law. What set Khomeini apart from the other teachers and scholars of Qum was a religious tract in which he laid down in the minutest detail how a good Muslim should behave, how to defecate, how to urinate, how to have sexual intercourse, how to eat and how to clean your teeth. It was central to Khomeini's teachings that Western influences were poisoning Islam. He actually coined a word for it, West toxication. He began to preach sermons against the Shah of Iran for introducing un-Islamic Western practices into the country. Richard Helms, former head of the CIA, was ambassador to Iran in the 70s. Well, uh, American officials were aware of Khomeini because he first came into prominence in 1963, I believe it was, when he opposed the Shah's land reform policy and actually put the mobs in the streets at that time in an effort to uh, stop this policy. <laughs> Khomeini, instead of being executed, as he might well have been, was exiled to uh, Najaf in Iraq. The holy city of Najaf is in Iran's neighboring country, Iraq. <laughs> Fifty-five percent of Iraq's population is Shiite. Khomeini found religious and political allies here. The Khomeini people began to pass tapes back and forth through the pilgrims who were then allowed to go to Najaf and Karbala and the other holy places of Iraq. Khomeini's message then was to get rid of this corrupt, dirty regime of the Shah which permitted uh, women to dress the way they did, uh, girls and boys to be together in universities, uh, passing money around to uh, build great structures when actually it should be uh, given to the peasants. I mean, there were a variety of messages locked in there, but they were all anti-Shah. In those days, Iran's king of kings saw the clergy as an impediment to progress. It was his dream to create a strong secular state. But to Khomeini, a government without God was a blasphemy. Khomeini and his followers were further incensed by the Shah's pro-American policies, according to Marvin Zonis, one of the foremost authorities on Iranian affairs and a man whose views are frequently sought by U.S. government officials. The Shah brought the United States in with a vengeance. There were 50,000 Americans living in Tehran alone by 1976, and there was a perception on the part of the Iranians that Iranian culture was being destroyed by an invasion from the United States, which was the responsibility of the monarch. From his exile in Iraq, Khomeini kept preaching against the Shah and the West. A 13-year exile had failed to silence him, and in 1978, the Shah was getting nervous. The Shah of Iran called up the president of Iraq, Saddam Hussein, and asked President Hussein to get the Ayatollah out of Iraq so he would be further away from the revolution. Hussein agreed, and by the way, that's one of the important reasons why Ayatollah Khomeini is pushing the Iran-Iraq war, because of his personal bitterness to President Hussein of Iraq. And Hussein announced to Khomeini as follows that he was being thrown out of Iraq. France offered Khomeini political asylum, but his exile here lasted barely four months. Much to the Shah's surprise, and to the surprise of Ayatollah Khomeini, it was easier for him to maintain communication with the revolution in Tehran from Paris than it was to remain in communication with the revolution in Tehran from Iraq. The reason being that the French had spent billions to build a modern telephone system which allowed you to direct dial Tehran from Paris. So Ayatollah Khomeini basically had had a bank of telephones installed in his house in the outskirts of Paris. They had tape recorders in Paris hooked up 
to tape recorders in Tehran connected by this new phone system, and they would send the Ayatollah's pronouncements constantly over the telephone system to Tehran, where the tapes would be recorded and then reproduced and sold all over Tehran within hours of Khomeini's latest utterance. So there isn't any doubt that those cassettes played a role in what occurred in 1978 and 79. Street riots and civil unrest finally brought the Shah's reign to an end. Not all those who risked their lives in the streets were followers of Khomeini. Some were communists. Many wanted a Western-style democracy in Iran. Yet the power of religion proved to be the decisive factor in the fall of the Shah. The Islamic revolution of Iran, there were two revolutions. It was two things. Partly it was a liberal revolt, and partly it was a fanatic mad revolt. And the two revolts burst on the scene at the same time. And then the clerical, fanatical one triumphed over the more moderate one. And the, the consequences for the region have been enormously devastating, because in a way it was a triumph of the politics of extremism over the politics of moderation. From the moment Khomeini stepped out from the Air France jumbo jet, he acted like a head of state. The first words he addressed on Iranian soil to the thousands of supporters who were waiting for him were quite uncompromising. We must cut off the hands of the foreigners who are responsible for our ills and cast out all the roots of the old regime. Henceforth, Khomeini's interpretation of the Koran would become the law of the land. Iran's man of God would only rule according to the word of God. In the months that followed, Khomeini and his supporters consolidated their power and introduced a full-scale Islamic Republic. The clergy took control of the country. The storming of the American embassy and the taking of American hostages was part of a wholesale purge of all Western and especially American influences. For devout Shias, Khomeini was seen as the first legitimate ruler since the martyrdom of Hussein 1,300 years before. But Khomeini never meant to confine his revolution inside the borders of Iran. Khomeini didn't recognize national borders at all. His message was intended for the whole Muslim world, whose leaders and governments Khomeini deemed to be ungodly and therefore illegitimate. The worst government of all in Khomeini's eyes was neighboring Iraq. In Iraq, Saddam Hussein had tightened his grip on the reins of power. The streets of Baghdad were papered with his portraits. But Saddam Hussein's position was threatened. Terror on radio was calling on the faithful to replace the gangster and tyrant with the rule of divine justice. Al-Dawa, the party of Iraqi Shiite fundamentalists, were Khomeini's natural allies in Iraq. They staged protests. They rioted. Khomeini wanted to see an Islamic republic in Iraq. The Ayatollah even named the man who would replace Saddam Hussein and become the Khomeini of Iraq. Even by the standards of the Middle East, Saddam Hussein is a ruthless leader. As far as he was concerned, al-Dawa and Khomeini's supporters were the agents of a hostile state and should be dealt with accordingly. This kind of model doubtlessly is an agent as an official agent. Therefore, we have got to cut off their necks. Hussein struck hard at al-Dawa. Thousands were arrested, and a hundred people publicly hanged. Among them, the man Khomeini had named as Hussein's successor. 
another 15,000 Iraqi Shias were expelled and sought refuge in Iran. Confident now of his position at home, Iraq's strongman decided to deal with Khomeini and Iran once and for all. Saddam Hussein of Iraq took it upon himself to quarantine and defeat the Iranian revolution. He launched this war in September 80. He declared it, he called it Saddam's war. Iraq failed to win a quick victory in Saddam's war. That failure threatens the stability of countries throughout the Middle East. And yet, paradoxically, the war has strengthened the position of Khomeini and his Islamic government. Iranians are now united in a holy war, according to the writer and journalist Dilip Hero. On the 1st of April 1979, the government of God was set up in Iran. And if somebody like Saddam Hussein attacked Iran, he attacked the House of Islam. And therefore, all those people who follow Ayatollah Khomeini as a religious leader, they have to fight this infidel and his regime. These are the Basij, civilian volunteers who go straight to the front, their faith strengthened by songs of the Battle of Karbala and the martyr Hussein. They think that Karbala is in the bondage of this unbeliever Saddam Hussein, and therefore it is their religious duty to liberate Karbala. If you see the people who are, you know, wear this uh, headband, they are Basij volunteers, and, and the band says, lover of Karbala. And the people who sign up to go to fight, they are called caravans to Karbala. The government has launched a huge recruiting drive and aspiring martyrs are forming caravans to Karbala. The local mullah joins the men of his congregation to fight in this jihad or holy war. A copy of the Quran is held over each busload of men to bless them on their holy journey. The flags with religious slogans are in short supply and are gathered up to be reissued to the next group of volunteers. Lieutenant Amin Zadeh, a former regular army officer, saw two and a half years active service in the Gulf War. The clergy have today assumed the role of commanders in the armed forces and they try to control all aspects of life of the personnel of the military forces. We had three sessions each week from the political ideological unit in our barracks where mullahs used to come and address different topics. And in all these topics, what we were always indoctrinated with was the theory that we should export our revolution to the entire world. The clergy are not familiar with the techniques and the tactics of warfare. They know nothing about military life, and yet the fate of each personnel is at their hands. Once people have signed up, without giving them any military training, they are herded to the war front, indoctrinating them to die first is an honor. And the age range varies from a boy of 11 to an old man of around 80.
Despite terrible losses, at least 200,000 dead, the morale of Iran's fighting men appears undiminished. They've fought the invader to a standstill, achieved breakthroughs on the southern front. In this holy war, the spirit of Karbala and the martyr Hussein is more potent than modern weapons. For the Iranians, the biggest disappointment of the war has been the failure of their fellow Shiites in Iraq to rise up and join their side. In Iraq, nationalism has proved to be more powerful than religion. But in Iran, it is religious fervor that has driven suicide waves of volunteers to charge across minefields. Some volunteers have come to the front carrying their own coffins. Others wear slogans saying, the Ayatollah has given me permission to enter heaven. For today's Iranians are fighting the battle of Karbala again. To die in a holy war is to die a martyr. Perhaps this is some consolation to the fathers who gather in Tehran morgue to identify their dead sons. Khomeini himself has written, the more people, especially young ones, who die for our cause, the stronger we shall become. Muslims everywhere, he wrote, must conquer the fear of death so that they can conquer the whole world. The remains of those killed in battle are laid to rest in the martyr's cemetery. This one cemetery contains over 50,000 dead. On the edge of the cemetery, a fountain flows with red water to symbolize the blood of the dead martyrs. This was once the palatial home of a friend of the Shah. It is now a military hospital run by an organization called the Martyrs Foundation. The young men in this ward have all suffered crippling wounds at the front line. This is destiny and the will of God. If for some 18 years of my life I was able to be more active and use my legs, this was a gift from God and it was His will to take it back. I'm not bothered with what has happened to me and I still do whatever I can to serve Islam and the Muslim community. The Martyrs Foundation also takes care of war orphans. It is run by a close associate of Khomeini, Ayatollah Karubi. <laughs> Karubi is already teaching the children in his care how they too can be martyrs when they grow up. Our children right from when they are in their cradles and their mother's laps are infused with the logic of martyrdom, struggle and Imam Hussein. A bit of the soil from Imam Hussein's tomb is put in their mouths. They are told why Imam Hussein rose and how he was martyred. The child is called after people who took part in holy wars and lived by the sword and were martyred. All this lingers in the child's mind as memories. 
The child probably has no knowledge of religion or Sunnism or Shiism, but the spirit of the whole thing envelops it. running the country now, they have made society as Islamic as they can. All aspects of life have been changed. If you take the law and the judicial system, they have been brought into line with Islam. If you take education, all the textbooks have been changed to be brought into line with Islam, right from elementary school to university. If you're thinking of a banking, banking is now Islamic banking. That means there's no interest being paid on deposits. Then when it comes to women in the street, they have to cover them just completely, you know, to show only their faces, not to show their hair or their arms and so on. Then the social side of Islam, there's no alcohol to be consumed by Muslims, no nightclubs, no cinemas showing uh, sexy movies, and um, certain kind of music is not allowed. That music which is erotic is not allowed. Under Khomeini, it has become mandatory to pray at the mosque each week. On Fridays in Tehran, it's impossible to see where politics ends and religion begins. Every city and town has a Friday prayer leader who is appointed by Ayatollah Khomeini. And it's a very important position because in the sermon that the leader gives, not only does he talk about theological aspects of Islam, but he talks about politics, what's happening in the country, what Iran is doing, what its policies are. So it's a very important forum for the Islamic leaders in Iran to educate their people and to build up a public opinion for a certain policy of the government. You know, and in that sense, it's a very important aspect of life. In some ways, Iran has returned to the Middle Ages. On the anniversary of the martyrdom of Hussein, Iranians of all ages parade through the streets, scourging themselves with whips and chains. The legend of Hussein's martyrdom is as essential to the Shia's belief as the crucifixion of Jesus is to Christians. These 20th century tears for a 7th century saint are real enough. But there is no true religious harmony in Iran today because those clerics who might disagree with the way Khomeini interprets their faith are afraid to speak out, according to a former diplomat and exiled opponent of the regime. Apart from Khomeini, there are five other Grand Ayatollahs in Iran who hold the same eminent position in terms of, uh, relig in terms of the religious hierarchy. Now, all the others disagree with Khomeini on theological grounds. All do not accept his interpretation of the Layat al faqih or the governance of the theologians. However, they keep silent, or they are silenced, uh, because of the fear of intimidation and fear of imprisonment or other harsher measures. Mr. Khomeini defrocked Grand Ayatollah Shariat Madari for having disagreed with his interpretation of religious law and so on. In Mashhad, this has led to the virtual house arrest of Grand Ayatollah Qomi, and uh, it has led, for example, to the arrest of the representative of uh, Ayatollah Khoi, who lives in Iraq, and his beating up by the revolutionary guards who intimidated him beat him up, shaved his beard, and uh, released him. This kind of intimidation goes on against any religious or non-religious uh, personality who dares oppose the Khomeini system and his interpretation of Islamic law. 
Khomeini sees himself as a pan-Islamic leader. Though his Shia sect is only 10% of the Muslim world, his message appeals to fundamentalists throughout Islam. His voice is broadcast 24 hours a day and reaches the Muslim populations of Soviet Central Asia and mainland China. You see his portrait in Egypt, in Indonesia, in the Philippines, and on the Arab West Bank of Israel. And the message is always the same to rise up to overthrow ungodly rulers and governments and set up what the Iranians call a society of the just. This revolutionary message does not just stop at talk. In the holy city of Qum, Ayatollah Khomeini's government is laying the foundations for Islamic revolutions around the world. A leading activist is Ayatollah Karubi. I should say a revolution is a revolution of ideology. It is a revolution from God, meaning it receives orders directly from the Creator. This revolution has a direct link to the world of eternity. As for the export, it is only natural that a revolution like this, a revolution of thought and ideology, moves forward. It should be exported, and it will be. We will be persistent in exporting it. The government encourages foreign Shiites to come to Iran to study the theory and practice of the Iranian revolution. As many as 45 different nationalities attend these classes. I have uh, Islamic students in Iran and I hope to research about any knowledge of Islamic revolution and I hope this revolution to development in all of the world. We think that if we can get the message of uh, Islam across and the whole world knows what the Islam talks about, then uh, of course it will uh, uh, bring about some changes in the world as a whole. Robin Wright, a former network correspondent in the Middle East, has first-hand knowledge of Iran's efforts to export its revolution. The Iranians have openly stated that they have supported what they view as liberation movements, what other quarters might see as terrorist movements um, throughout the Middle East. And even there's a group in downtown Tehran at a specific building where many of the groups are headquarters, affiliated with the Philippines, a Muslim group, the Moro National Liberation Front. The Iranians have made no secret about it and in, in fact have boasted of their success in supporting various groups. Perhaps the biggest liberation movement backed by Iran is the al-Dawa party, made up of Iraqi Shiites. Al-Dawa is now an underground organization with headquarters in Tehran. Al-Dawa has conducted guerrilla warfare inside Iraq and has been linked to acts of terror in the Gulf region. Al-Dawa is part of the Supreme Council of the Islamic Revolution. Its leader is the man who would become ruler of Iraq if Iran wins the war. His name is Mohammed Bakir Hakim. The Supreme Council plays a key coordinating role in Iran's export of the revolution. With offices here in Tehran and in London, Rome, Damascus and other cities, it funnels considerable sums of Iranian government money to a variety of liberation movements. We are Iraqi exiles here in Iran. We are involved in a movement which is dedicated to the overthrow of the regime of Saddam Hussein. Our aim is to establish an Islamic Republic in Iraq. Iran is in the middle of a war with Iraq and Iraq is, of course, Iran's neighboring country. Therefore, it is only natural that Iran should give its support and assistance to us. These liberation movements receive practical training from Iran. The Iranians run two training camps in Iran in which some probably four to five thousand Muslims from all over the world are brought into those training camps and infused with the spirit of revolutionary Islam and with lessons in a very practical sense about how to conduct the revolution and then sent back to their countries. There were riots, for example, in the Islamic sections of Yugoslavia 
and they were traced to Islamic clerics from Yugoslavia who had been to training camps in Iran and been trained in Khomeini's revolutionary terrorist training camps. Iran is clearly training, recruiting in some cases, and perhaps financing uh, people who support the Islamic movement and are prepared to carry out acts of violence. The Iranians have actually boasted about some of their recruits and allowed Western reporters in to see a few of them. The training camps in Iran provide both political slash religious training as well as military training. They're largely very primitive in terms of the kind of military training they provide. Basic things such as assembling rifles, small scale bombs, teaching people how to hide or conceal bombs in vehicles. The car bomb is the trademark of the Shiite terrorist. Since 1983, the U.S. Embassy in Beirut was car bombed twice. The U.S. Embassy in Kuwait was bombed, one of five buildings blown up in a single day. Shiite extremists planted a bomb in the official car of the ruler of Kuwait. Iran has been linked to these and many other acts of terror throughout the Gulf region. The conservative rulers of these oil-rich states fear the message of the Iranian revolution and have tended to side with Iraq in the Gulf War. Ayatollah Khomeini has clearly been opposed to the system of monarchy in the key Gulf states. He has said over and over that they will uh, roast in hell if they don't change their ways. And I think that there are many in Kuwait and Bahrain, for example, who feel that the Iranians played roles directly or indirectly in the bombing in 1983 of the U.S. Embassy and the French Embassy and other installations in Kuwait and the 1981 coup attempt in Bahrain. In 1984, Shiite terrorists hijacked a Kuwaiti Airlines jet to Tehran. They murdered two American officials who were on board. Western telephone intercepts revealed that Iran was directly implicated in the hijacking. The Iranians actually provided a pistol and the rope to tie up the passengers. U.S. satellite photos are said to show commercial airliners parked at Iranian training camps. They are used to give hands-on instruction to future hijackers. Terrorists are also trained at secret enclosures inside Revolutionary Guard and army camps like this one. Lieutenant Amin Zadeh was asked to carry out special missions abroad by a member of his unit's political ideological section. He said, for example, you will be charged with missions to do away with people who are either opposed to Khomeini outside the country or of leaders outside of Iran who are opposed to Khomeini and this will not be an act of terrorism uh, but a revolutionary execution. But Iran's biggest effort to export its revolution has been in Lebanon. Lebanese Shiites had played little role in Beirut's endemic civil war. But when Israel invaded Lebanon and America sent in the Marines, Khomeini saw an opportunity to spread his influence. For Khomeini sees America and Israel as the twin Satans, the two main enemies of the Islamic religion. Israel is perhaps the single greatest enemy of the Muslim people for Ayatollah Khomeini. First, Israel sits on territory which rightly belongs to Muslims. Secondly, Israel controls the third most holy shrine in all of Islamdom, which is to say the holy mosques in Jerusalem. Thirdly, of course, Khomeini sees Israel as constantly expanding to take new territories from the Muslims and also to conquer new Muslims and incorporate it into an Israeli empire. Finally, Israel is the agent of American imperialism. Israel is really only an agent for the designs of the United States on the Muslim peoples. And ultimately, therefore, Israel can be defeated only if the United States is defeated. 
In 1982, Khomeini sent his revolutionary guards to Lebanon. On their way, they paraded through the streets of Damascus, chanting revolutionary slogans, stamping on the flag of imperialism, and trampling the symbol of Zionism. The volunteers came here to the Bekaa Valley in eastern Lebanon, near the border with Syria. They established their headquarters in a fortress looking down on the ancient ruins of Baalbek. The fortress was later bombed by Israeli and French warplanes, killing 14 revolutionary guards. The town of Baalbek has provided many converts for Ayatollah Khomeini. The shadowy organization Islamic Jihad is believed to be based here. But the main political organization is the radical Shiite Party of God, Hezbollah. Hezbollah has links with Iran both specifically and ideologically. The movement is in many ways an offshoot of the Iranian revolution in that it probably would not have grown to the level or the power that it has without the revolution. I have met several people within Hezbollah who have said, yes, um, we have links with Iran. We follow the Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, he is our leader and he gives us our orders. It was here among the Shiites of Lebanon and the gunmen of Hezbollah that Khomeini would find eager recruits for his cult of martyrdom. Now here has been the genius, and in my opinion, the evil genius of the Khomeini revolution was to sell this cult of martyrdom to the young and to the poor. I don't know if, any, if, if that many wealthy Muslim boys have committed martyrdom. This whole cult of martyrdom has been a way that you could seduce the young and send them off to die, either to drive Israel out of the south of Lebanon or to fight in the, uh, on, in the Iran-Iraq war with this incredible carnage that's, that's taking place before us. So there has been a willingness to die. Those willing to die were young. They included Shiites and other radicals. Their last words were videotaped before they left on their suicide missions. This Mercedes is packed with 200 pounds of explosives. A Shiite cameraman is recording the event. The bomb killed 12 Israeli soldiers. At one point, the Israeli army suffered one suicide attack per week. So here you have the state of Israel with all its might, with all its arsenal, with all its power and its organization coming into Lebanon. And then a feeling develops in Lebanon that the rest of the Arab world is just merely a spectator. So then among this desperate people who live in southern Lebanon and the, and the slums of greater Beirut, you then are able to recruit 60 or 70 or 100 people and send them to die against Israel and get fantastic results by the logic of those who would like to drive Israel out of Lebanon. Now the prestige of this phenomenon simply you know, grew out of all proportion. The Iranian government knows that terrorism pays. What we saw in Lebanon when 251 Marines were killed and subsequently a great superpower was forced to withdraw from a country when all that was used was not armies or a vast number of men, essentially two trucks, two lunatics, and $50,000 worth of uh, explosives achieved this aim. The echoes of those explosions are still reverberating throughout the Middle East. Though Khomeini has so far failed to create a second Islamic Republic, his success in Lebanon is winning fresh converts. Throughout the Muslim world, the withdrawal of the Marines has been seen as a victory of Islamic moral force over American military might. 
Washington's defeat is symbolized by the concrete defenses which now surround the White House and the fear of many Americans that it could happen at home. The meeting of the subcommittee will come to order. The fear of Shiite terror spreading to the U.S. prompted both houses of Congress to hold hearings on Islamic fundamentalism. Lebanon and Iran. The United States needs to know more about the nature of Islamic fundamentalism and why it has some radical and extreme expressions. The impetus for this new Shiism came from Iran, the only Shia state in the realm of Islam. But there was plenty of material in the Arab world for the spark to feed upon. I think for the first time we are beginning to see the potential for the expansion of fundamentalist activity or terrorism or whatever word you want to give it um, to the United States, that the U.S. is vulnerable as never before, in large part because of the escalating tension. Rather than dealing constructively with ways of diffusing the crisis, the U.S. has in many ways provoked the fundamentalist to the point that they are now um, there are now indications that they're prepared to act elsewhere they've certainly threatened it this mosque only a mile from Capitol Hill has been the focus of a long-running dispute among American Muslims the majority of the congregation is made up of Sunni moderates but a faction of radical American Shiites seized the mosque and held it for three months before being expelled Now, every Friday, the radicals hold a rival prayer meeting across the street. These rights have to be extracted by the accompanying use of force, not because Muslims are thirsty for the use of force and the consequences of the use of this force, but because that is the only language that the usurpers of the rights of man understand. Radical Shiite groups are known to have been recruiting a network of Khomeini sympathizers inside America. And there are many terrorist experts in the United States who have said that there are actually networks already in place. There is a large Shiite population in this country, although Americans must differentiate. Every Shiite is not a terrorist, nor is every Muslim a terrorist. There's only a very small fringe in the Muslim community that is responsible for these acts. In the past, acts of terror like PLO hijackings have been desperate attempts at political protest, ultimately a sign of weakness. But Shiite terror is different. Actions like the TWA hijack are opening rounds in a long holy war to win the world to the cause of Islamic revolution. Iran's adventurism in Lebanon and the terrorism it has inspired in the Gulf and other parts of the Middle East are just sideshows compared with the war it's waging with Iraq, the Gulf War. Strategically, most military analysts describe it as a stalemate. But those who believe that may be seriously underestimating the true strength of Iran's position. It has five times the land area and three times the population of Iraq. Its troops appear to be more highly motivated. It still manages to procure the Western military equipment it needs. And while Iraq has accumulated some $40 billion in war debts, Iran has borrowed nothing. It even paid back the international debts it inherited from the Shah. So in a long war of attrition, it seems the time is on the side of Iran. Should the regime of Saddam Hussein be defeated by the Iranian regime, and should the Iraqi Shia establish a regime in Iran's image, in Iran's image, then the bets are off in the Gulf. You know, definitely there will be trouble in Kuwait, trouble in Bahrain, where there are Shia communities waiting to see the outcome of that war. There would also be a change in the balance of power in Lebanon, Syria, to the advantage of the Shia, to the advantage of the Alawis, against the Sunnis, against the dominant order, if you will, in the region. We are dealing with a resurgent Islam, with a revitalized group of Muslim peoples all over the world who are seeking what they consider to be justice, which they believe they deserve and which they believe they have not yet achieved. The consequences of the spread 
of Shiite fundamentalism are not good for American interests in the region. I think it's fair to say that when it spreads, the United States loses because it tends to carry with it this great Satan complex of the Khomeini regime. In other words, to put it in simple language, when they win, we lose. For part of this war, the United States has been helping Iraq with economic aid and with shared intelligence. But some observers say it is perhaps not in our best interest to have Iraq win the war, given that regime's own reputation for brutality. They say it might be better to see both sides drained of resources so that neither emerges the victor. Next week on Frontline, a report on our closest ally, England, a nation in trouble. It's the story of a country divided between the very rich and the desperate poor. Everybody seems to be going unemployed. The south of England is still the land of nobility and grace, of privilege and power. What would happen if you, if you were a member of the so-called working class? I'm sure I'd be very annoyed. But in the north, there is no work, no money, and little hope. The poor happen to be all in the north of England, and the rich tend all to be in the south of England. So one risks a confrontation, I think, in the end, a geographical confrontation. The program is called, Will There Always Be in England? It is next week on Frontline. I'm Judy Woodruff. Good night. For a transcript of this program, please send $4 to Frontline, Box 322, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. Frontline is produced for the Documentary Consortium by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Frontline was provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide, and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Schools, colleges, and other organizations interested in purchasing or renting video cassettes of this program may call 800 424 7963 or write PBS Video, Post Office Box 8092, Washington, D.C. 20024.